Welcome to the all-in-one Inferno speedrunning guide. Here, my goal is to teach you the core principles and basic strategies used to achieve the main time thresholds in Inferno speedrunning. These include sub-65 for the Grandmaster combat achievements, the sub-55 Chinchampa threshold, sub-52 for Oblivion and Solitary PVM diaries, the sub-50 Legacy threshold, and then even further beyond. Outside of teaching the main principles, I'm also going to cover the common solutions to various spawns, teach you the basics of the Chin, Scythe, and Thrall techs, and I'm going to cover tips that many Inferno speedrunners have picked up over hundreds of hours worth of runs. I want to keep the intro short, so if you have a specific section that you want to learn about, here's the table of contents so you can skip right to it. You can also find it timestamped in the description below. And lastly, if you want to join a community filled with people learning to speedrun the Inferno, or just want access to useful information and resources, come check out the Inferno speedrunning Discord at discord.gg zuck. Many of the top Inferno speedrunners there helped contribute to this guide, including some of the names you'll see on screen right now, so special thanks to them for helping out. Now with that being said, let's get into it. So before you begin speedrunning the Inferno, you should first be comfortable with the basic mechanics normally used during the first cape. This means you should feel comfortable doing one tick blob flicking, the mage range pillar off tick, flicking two large monsters at the same time, using the north nibbler barrage spot, and the blowpipe healer pattern. If you aren't comfortable with these mechanics yet, you can easily practice them outside the Inferno by blowpiping solo ulm head phase in Chambers of Zarek, blowpiping rats in Verox sewers, and flicking Desus in Nightmare Zone to get used to the timing for one tick alternating. Alternatively, you can also practice these methods in the Inferno during an off-task run as well. Learning these mechanics is heavily suggested prior to actually speedrunning, as they are core mechanics used in almost every run at every time. So consider these the bare minimum requirements to really start speedrunning. This is a setup largely based on the ones provided by the Inferno speedrunning discord. You can swap the Ring of Suffering for Ring of the Gods if you think you need more prayer. Sandfuse can also be used instead of restores since they give an extra prayer point per dose at 97 prayer. This is the optimal level for Inferno speedrunning due to it providing the maximum prayer per potion dose. A Falador Shield 4 can also be used since it holds more prayer in its two recharges than a single Sandfew, but it's not required at this time. If you are aiming to go faster than sub-65 in the future, then you can opt to swap a restore for chins to get used to them but since they're not recommended for sub-65 runs, the basics of chins are going to be discussed in the sub-55 section instead. As someone aiming for the sub-65 time, you want to focus on four main goals. Stay range potted and attack with rigor on at all times. Avoid rushing yourself into situations without thinking it through first. Get into the habit of killing the mages first. Start in the center on simple and easy waves. Staying potted and attacking with rigor is the first step to speedrunning. Having rigor on alone is better than doing the full 6 way range switch. Similarly, staying potted is zero effort and it's a passive time save on every attack you do, so make sure you have both of these on at all times. If you're worried about the prayer that rigor is going to use, you have options, but you're probably going to have to flick more. You can opt to lazy flick rigor, you can one tick flick single monsters, or if it really comes down to it, you can take a ring of the gods. Avoid rushing into situations without thinking first. At a sub 65 level, you're gonna lose so much more time just rushing yourself, taking 65 damage and then panicking, than you are by taking two seconds to think about your solve, play it safe, and then off tick the monsters properly. Now this doesn't mean go AFK behind the pillar every wave. But the goal is to plan a few steps ahead on dangerous waves so you're not out in the open with zero plan. Get into the habit of killing the mage first, even if it means that you have to flick a ranger or a blob to do so. You're okay to kill unavoidable bats before the mage, but killing a blob or a ranger before the mage should be strictly off limits as these situations are always avoidable and a single revive will drastically slow your run down. Lastly, 
Simple waves should all be started in or close to the center. Simple waves have very easy to flick monsters or monsters which only attack with the same style. Range Blob or Mage Melee Bat would be good examples of this since the combination of monsters is easy to safe spot or easy to flick. More complex waves with blobs, bats, melees, and a ranger mage can be started back at the pillar since the combination of monsters can be hard to flick if you're not used to the fundamental safe spots. If necessary, you can also retreat if you're starting a wave on low HP. Otherwise, starting centralized is important as it allows you to reach more spawns without losing unnecessary ticks. If you're hugging the north pillar on range double bat and everything spawns south, you've just lost 10 seconds against a wave where all you had to do was pray range. Be confident in your ability to start waves up close and personal. Even if you mess up, you're going to have more opportunities to heal. So fundamental barrage procedure. Ice and blood barrage have specific uses during the speedrun, however overusing them is going to result in heavy time loss. The same idea goes for chins, which is why they're not recommended for sub-65. Generally speaking, players should only barrage once for the nibblers and once for each set of mini blobs. Finish off the remainders with a blowpipe whenever you are close and not in danger. At a sub-65 level, you can start with blood barrage if you're under 80 HP. Ice barrage is useful if your pillars are in danger or if you're full HP, but otherwise isn't really necessary. For 6 nibbler waves, stand next to the nibbler spawn to reduce travel delay on your barrage. This is similar to t-bowing a mage from up close if it's the last monster in the wave. Blood barraging is preferred for 6 nibblers to stop them from unclumping, contrary to ice barrage. If you really need the health, you can also stand at max distance from spawn to blood barrage the nibblers and then immediately run as close as possible to cast a second barrage on the pile to get double healing. Casting blood barrage on the final monster of the wave when killing it using a blowpipe results in a phantom barrage. There's no damage dealt because the monster's already dead, but you have the chance to heal for what you would have barraged if it was still alive. This is a very crucial mechanic used even at the sub-50 level, and it can help sustain you throughout the waves without having to brew. Keep in mind that casting barrage too early when the monster hasn't died will result in losing 5 ticks, so only use it when you're sure that the monster is dead. In addition, NPCs like mages and melees have such high magic defense that the likelihood to actually phantom them is basically zero, so it's recommended to not even bother phantoming these to reduce the risk of unnecessary time loss. So here I'm going to demonstrate safe spotting principles used at all levels of Inferno speedrunning, as well as showcase some useful tiles which can help in sticky situations. During your first cape, you probably learned that you could trap melees west and south of the pillar, but not east and north. Furthermore, you can set up corner traps like these to gain further mobility or line of sight as long as the monster is still caught on the pillar. Now this principle can be extrapolated to any monster in the inferno that isn't nibblers or mini blobs. This essentially means that all monsters in the inferno are just pillars that you can trap the melees on, making many of the waves way easier because mages, ranges, and blobs can all be flicked together, and they all help you safe spot the melee as well. Similarly, a digging melee can be instantly safe spotted by standing northwest of a monster and then immediately standing northeast after it finishes its dig. These principles used in conjunction provide you with a method to safe spot the melee on the vast majority of waves, and to demonstrate how integral this principle is, I can literally safe spot a melee on this bat. Recognizing that monsters are also pillars is the most important thing to note in this section. Similarly, you can use other NPCs to block bats from reaching you due to their short attack range. This is enough that you can blowpipe a bat from one tile in front of a ranger or a blob. Or you can prey against a melee and blowpipe the bat behind it. The mage, however, is too long to blowpipe the bat from without getting meleeed by the mage, and thus it's suggested that you kill the mage before you move on to the bat. In addition to these principles, there are also a few tiles with specific uses that allow you to attack high priority monsters without ruining your positioning. For example, this tile can be used to attack the nibblers without being lured into the range of the melee. 
This tile can be used to attack a mage spawn in the far northwest without unluring the trapped melee. This tile can be used to barrage or chin nibblers on the south pillar without unluring this melee. When using these three major tiles as well as the safe spotting principles outlined before, players should learn to not be afraid of incoming melees as there's always a potential safe spot. Mastering these fundamentals will only become more important as you get faster, and the strategies learned are tremendously useful at any stage of Inferno speedrunning. As a speedrunner, the number of brews you can take without losing time is limited. As you get faster, you'll be taking 4, 3, or maybe even 2 brews per run, so using them properly is an overlooked but important skill used for speedrunning. Brewing more than needed will consume both your range pot and your brews, which are integral later on for players attempting a healer skip. The key thing to remember is that you only need to brew enough to survive to the next wave. Blood barraging nibblers and phantom barrages at the end of the wave make it so you actually gain health on average if you don't tank big hits. Thus, it's common to brew only once or twice at a time. As a general rule of thumb, brew on dangerous waves if you're below 40 HP, or if there's immediate threat of death. This can come from missing a mage or a range prayer, or tanking mini blobs and bats under 20 HP. It also helps to consider the difficulty of the upcoming wave, whether or not there will be opportunities to heal, and whether or not you need to redefine range pot soon. If you're forced to brew mid-wave, the most important thing to remember is to keep prayer flicking. If you panic and stop flicking, the next attacks are going to compound and they're going to kill you regardless of how many brews you sip, so always remember to keep flicking while you're brewing. Some monsters in the Inferno have longer death animations than others. This means killing them last in the wave will take longer even if you kill them in the same number of hits. For a sub-65 run, you won't need to pay too much attention to this, but the main thing that you should know is that killing melees as the last monster alive will result in automatic time loss. For sub-65, you should always kill the melee early in the wave to prevent it from digging and to stop it from dying last before wave 35. If you applied the save spots from 1.6, then this should be very easy. After wave 35, it's recommended that you kill the melee after the mage since melees have significant defense and can dig into your time if you let them revive. At this level, the recommended kill order is to prioritize anything that's unflickable and is doing damage to you, this means bats and mini blobs, then kill the mage, and then kill the easily safe spotted melee, then deal with the range, and then finally deal with the blob. This order makes the run as smooth as possible while still avoiding the biggest time losses. If a monster dies while it's moving, then it will drag before dying. This occurs often since range damage happens after you've fired your weapon, so if I shoot a melee and then walk away, the melee will walk towards me before the damage actually registers, and this will cause a drag death. Doing this can cause up to two extra ticks of delay before starting the death animation, so if you think an NPC such as a melee or a bat has died, don't move until after the death animation has started. This is especially the case when running through monsters such as a melee or a range to sight something behind it. Always make sure you wait a tick before the hit registers before you walk underneath or away from dying NPCs. Additionally, if you're blowpiping a bat behind a dying melee, you should step forward on the third blowpipe after the melee has died, or else the bat will walk towards you, potentially causing a drag. If the bat is behind a ranger, then you should step forward on the second blowpipe for the same reason. You can also drag ranged NPCs if you shoot your projectile and then hide behind a pillar before it lands. In short, make sure the last NPC of the wave is dead before you start moving away. Past wave 50, it's recommended to start waves with your range top and bottom on, and standing from this tile, barrage the nibblers on spawn with a clear view of the entire arena. This tile allows you to barrage the nibblers without being seen from the vast majority of south spawns, and it also allows you to off-tick most of the spawns that do see you. Your main goal starting wave 50 is to find a way to kill the mage before any blob or any ranger. This means that you should either use the north pillar to isolate a mage with a blob, get the ranger to see you on a different tick than the mage, or have the mage in range stack up behind the pillar so you can perform a pillar off tick. 
Most waves at this stage are probably going to be solved either by running between sides of the north pillar, trapping the melee, or using the pillar optic, but I'm going to show you specific solves as well. A key thing to look for on spawn is whether or not they spawn in opposite corners. In this scenario, running out on the east side of the pillar will allow the east one to see me before the west one does, and this can be helpful on some south spawn off ticks. Here's another notorious spawn that's difficult for sub-65 runners. Here you can choose to wait two ticks and run to this side of the pillar to off tick the southern spawn, or you can run to the east side of the pillar at which you can perform another version of the pillar off tick. If you do decide to go to the east side pillar, make note that you have to start from the middle of the pillar and exit south, similar to how the regular pillar off tick requires that you exit west. With these solves in mind, just apply proper kill order and your late waves should be up to speed for sub 65. The Jad skip is really pretty simple. Tag Jad once and then continue with stuff as normal. If you're using game sounds, it's suggested that you default to range prayer until you hear Jad's mage attack, at which you pray mage and then switch back after. I suggest using a mix of both visuals and audio to recognize which attack happens, but visuals have the problem of zooming far out to see Jad, which can make you more likely to misclick when trying to tag and kill healers. Try to spawn healers as your shield is about to leave a corner. After that, tag and kill all of the healers with your blowpipe, but be aware that you cannot attack a healer immediately after it's been tagged so you should aim to attack a second healer while the first one is actually unattackable during its turnaround animation. After healers are dead, just re-range pot and keep attacking Zuck until it dies. You won't have to worry about a second set when you're speed running on task. The hardest part about Jad Skip is really just healers, but as long as you're trying not to rush and not to misclick while blowpiping, players actually find this skip to be pretty easy. This is the recommended sub-55 setup as provided by the Inferno Speedrunning Discord. The setup recommended can use Armadil or Crystal. Armadil actually has higher magic and melee defense, but it's got lower range defense, so it's largely just preference at this stage. If you find that you're lacking in prayer, swapping to Crystal can be ideal for the extra prayer bonus. The Elijah is recommended over a buckler, as this time threshold is all about getting used to and learning with chins, rather than being perfect with them. If you don't have an Elijah, then a Dragonfire Ward or a Twisted Buckler are also good alternatives, but you should note that you will be taking significantly more damage. Once you're more comfortable and efficient with your chin usage, it will become recommended to take the buckler instead, but this will largely be recommended for sub-52 and faster speedrunners. So now that you're aiming for a sub-55 completion, we're actually going to be implementing the use of chinchampas. This puts more emphasis on pathing, flicking, and avoiding damage since your opportunities to heal without losing time are significantly reduced. Aiming for a sub-55, your goal isn't actually to go as fast as possible, but rather to get comfortable with the basics and new habits using chinchampas. Sub-55 will just come naturally as you begin to master these techniques. Now this includes better pathing, better pillar and health management, using less blood barrages, keeping blobs intact, and popping blobs with other monsters alive so you can attack them during a blob's death animation. As you start to master these fundamentals, sub-55 is just going to come naturally, and then you can begin optimizing for speed, which will take you to the sub-52 and sub-50 sections. So the first thing to note about chins is that overusing them is going to make you lose time. At its core, chins have a lower max hit, less accuracy, and longer attack speed than a blowpipe. So if you're throwing a chin at something that can otherwise be blowpiped, you're basically losing time. Now one of the main examples of overusing chins is throwing them at single monsters that are only just out of blowpipe range. Now against a single monster, the rule of thumb is that if you didn't get dragged while throwing the chin, then it was actually better for you to just lose ticks running up to the monster and then blowpiping it normally. Overusing chins is also going to result in extra pillar damage that you didn't experience with barrage. Many players getting used to chins are going to realize that they're doing a no pillar on wave 60 because they aren't used to how much damage pillars take when only using chinchampas. Just because you have them doesn't mean you should use them. It's perfectly fine to blood barrage at the start of waves if you're uncomfortable with your health, 
or if you're going into a dangerous wave. To start, you should try and restrict using chins only to the nibblers at the start of a wave, for attacking mini blobs, and occasionally throwing them at monsters that are 10 squares away from you in order to help close the distance. Don't focus too hard on setting up difficult clumps just yet. Now clumping monsters with chins is usually a time save, but as a learner, if you lose ticks or significant health in the process, you still probably lost time overall. As a rule of thumb, you can say that every additional monster clumped in a chin is two ticks saved. So if you lost more than two ticks or a lot of health setting it up, you are probably better off not chinning them at all. As such, I'm going to show you some easy setups for clumping monsters, but don't feel obligated to hit them if it's going to pull you out of position or make you lose ticks. More advanced setups will be shown in the sub-52 and sub-50 sections. For now, here are the most basic chins. West Nibblers with Northwest Melee or Bat Spawn. Simply throw another chin at the Nibblers right after you've thrown your initial chin. If there's a gap between the nibblers, make sure you target the bat so it connects both the front and back nibblers. South nibs with a safe spotted south NPC. If it's a bat, it's ideal to stand out of its attack range and then target the bat to avoid losing run energy. If it's a melee, stand in the middle of the pillar and then target the nibbler and run back instantly to avoid getting meleeed. West and South Nibs are really easy to chin melees on because you can simply walk their southwest tile right next to the Nibblers and then you'll be able to chin them together. Always make sure you target the Nibblers when doing this. North Nibs can also lure bats onto them if they come from the northwest. This spot is much less common to use though compared to the other ones since finding yourself in this position is actually a lot more uncommon. Lastly, revived monsters are often spawned inside other monsters. As long as their southwest tiles are next to each other, it's usually pretty good to chin them. Throwing chins at far away monsters should be done conservatively, as new players tend to underestimate the reach of a blowpipe. Now by itself a blowpipe has a 5 tile attack range, but because of drag mechanics I can actually attack monsters that are 7 tiles away. And furthermore, if I pre-move during my attack cooldown, I can effectively attack monsters that are 9 tiles away from each other without losing any ticks. Now this principle is the main reason that throwing a chin at single monsters is never worth unless you see yourself get dragged in the process. Blowpiping is almost always the better alternative. Now that you have chins, it's also recommended to pop blobs with another monster in range so you can attack something while the mini blobs are spawning. In most cases, try to pop the blob with only one other monster attacking you, so you don't have to take too much damage. This means your new kill order looks something like this. The blob doesn't have to be popped after the melee, just as long as it's not before the mage or last in the wave, then it's fine. This is just to give you a rough idea of your priorities. Chins can also be used to tag Jad and healers during Zuck more efficiently, rather than just T-bowing Jad or T-bowing a faraway healer. Now that you have chins, starting centralized is essential since you have less opportunity to move after throwing a chin. When starting in the middle, almost every wave starts with the same procedure. It'll change slightly depending on specific spawns, but the simplified plan is this. Start most waves before 50 on this tile. Throw the chin and then attack a monster until the nibblers are clumped. This is usually enough time for two blowpipes or one Tebow. As soon as the nibblers clump up, you should kill them and move to a position where you can attack a monster while dragging the other NPCs towards you. This means monsters with high HP or that are near pillars are the ideal places to go, since you can attack them long enough to drag in the other spawns without them dying. If the nibblers spawn clumped, then you can simply throw another chin and move towards the NPC with the highest health as before. Nibblers should be killed as soon as you are in a convenient position to do so. At this stage, the only reason to leave them alive is if you want the pillar to go down intentionally, or you intend on chinning them later with a monster in the wave. At the sub-55 level, neither of these are necessary, so you should just finish the nibblers as soon as you're not going to lose either health or time for doing so. This is especially the case if all high HP monsters spawn away from the nibblers. A common example is the southeast ranger spawn and the west pillar nibblers. In situations like this, you should always kill the nibblers at the start of the wave or you will always lose time getting back to them later. 
So just to reiterate, attack the nibblers once and then attack another monster until the nibblers are clumped. Then finish the nibblers and try to pull the monsters within blowpipe range of each other. Pre-movement is something to expand your range of attackable monsters during the start of the wave as well as give you a lot of mobility and options during your run. You're not expected to master this yet, but the goal is to provide you with a sense of what to look for when deciding where to pre-move. Pre-moving at the start of the wave is just moving in a direction as soon as you've attacked the nibblers. This gives you the ability to instantly blowpipe 6 of the 9 spawns as soon as you're off attack cooldown, and it gives you the ability to attack all 9 spawns if you have a Tebow or Chinchampo equipped. To contrast this, without any pre-movement, you can only blowpipe 1 spawn and Tebow 6 of them without losing any ticks. On top of saving you ticks, pre-movement also gives you the extra time needed to drag in other monsters, as you can reach a pillar significantly quicker and thus pull everything in closer before the NPC you're attacking dies. This is why when you're trying to figure out where to pre-move to, the guideline we've provided is to move towards monsters with high HP and are near pillars. There's obviously exceptions, but for sub-55 it's good enough to simply follow this rule of thumb. So earlier we mentioned that you can now kill blobs while other monsters are still alive. As mentioned prior, you don't have to have a lot of monsters alive. As long as you have at least one alive when you pop the blob, you can usually hit it twice with your little pipe. Popping the blob with too many monsters alive forces you to flick them all and can have you take a lot of damage for it. Blob death animations are usually 4 ticks long, so every time you leave a blob as the last monster in the wave, you basically lost 4 ticks. After popping a blob, the most important thing is your positioning after it's died. This is a diagram of the tiles surrounding a blob. As soon as a blob dies, these bloblets begin moving underneath the death animation to the best position to attack you. Now most of the time this doesn't actually affect the position of the range or the mage, but depending on where you stand, the melee can be dragged out of the clump, which can make chinning very annoying, and it's also a significant time loss if you do it enough times. It's worth noting that the range mini blob also has more range defense than the other two, so it's optimal to stand on the green squares to allow you to clump all the minis together while chinning the mage or the melee. The yellow tiles are the second best tiles to stand on. If you can't reach the green tiles due to positioning issues, you should do your best to stand on the yellow tiles and then chin the ranger to clump all three of them. Technically, you can also stand on the tiles inside the blob as long as you're not standing on a tile that the minis spawn on, but for sub-55 you should just aim to stand around the blob so you don't drag it on accident by going under too early. Lastly, if you don't have the luxury of getting up close to the blob, you can stand any number of tiles north or east of the blob and the melee will path through the mage in range, allowing you to clump them in chin, assuming you attack early enough. This will only allow you to clump them for one attack, but a lot of the time that's all you need, so it's still useful nonetheless. Keep this diagram in your head, as keeping blobs clumped is a fundamental skill used extensively as you continue to get faster. As you probably already know, there's two main ways to flick a blob and a mage or range. The one tick alternating flick is the most common one and involves changing prayers every tick. The two tick method is a more advanced method and gives players a lot more room to do things since you have double the free time before changing prayers. However, the two tick method only works if you're flicking on the right cycle. Two tick blob flicking has two cycles, the cycle where a blob and a mage will see you on an even tick, or they'll see you on an odd number of ticks apart. As long as you start the waves on the center tile, every monster in the wave will automatically see you on the same tick or two ticks apart. As such, you can instantly two tick flick from the start of the wave as long as it's before 50. If you happen to off tick a blob and put it on the odd tick cycle, an easy way to recognize this is to check if the blob is attacking at the exact same time as the dominant monster. The even tick cycle always has a blob attacking either one tick before or a tick after the mage. So if a blob attacks the same time as the mage, then you know you're on the odd cycle. To two tick flick on the off cycle, you just need to put your prayer up a tick before the mage attacks you, instead of exactly when it attacks you. So here you're going to notice that the ranger is attacking me on the second tick of my prayer, rather than as soon as I put the range prayer on. It's worth noting that once a blob is on a cycle, it will stay on that cycle until one of the monsters loses sight of you. 
So if you miss a flick or tank a hit, don't worry, you can still two-tick flick just as normal and the blob will fix itself, similar to how a blob will fix itself when it's one-tick alternate flicking as well. So with Chins, most of the nuance is in shortening the distance between a blob and another monster so you can kill the blob and then attack the other monster. For most of the waves before 50, this is where you're going to save most of your time. One of the major methods to do this is to drag them together by hugging pillars. Many spawns will have optimal solves that are really just you running behind a pillar while blow piping something, and it's also going to double as a melee safe spot. As mentioned prior, the general guideline is that if a monster has high health and it's stuck to a pillar, it's a good idea to run towards it. This rule is going to have a couple exceptions, but at sub 55 you can be fine for most waves just following this advice. Monsters that walk towards you, such as bats and melees, can be kited towards blobs and then trapped or safe spotted on their corners so that you can kill the blob and then attack the monster while the blob is being popped. Waves 35 to 49 are often solved by safe spotting a melee using one of the methods from section 1.6 and then killing the mage while flicking between the blob and the mage. Any non-safe spotted bats should simply be killed instantly. When pushing for sub-55, your late wave mentality should be a lot more aggressive than your sub-65 approach. Waiting behind a pillar for everything to stack up is going to eat at your time if you do it repeatedly and it's an especially bad habit if you aim to get even faster. For the early 50s where the waves are mostly just mages in range, you should be very open to running outside of the north pillar to off take a spawn. Here are some examples of the main southern optics that you should keep in mind. So for most of these solves, step out west side instantly and prayer flick the one closer first. If you want, you can wait a tick before going south to try and set them two tick. Remember that from 1.6, you can safe spot melees on other NPCs as if they're pillars. If you do decide to wait for a pillar stack, then try to attack a visible monster while you're waiting. South plus southeast, mage in range. But you can go east or west side for the spawn. Run south whenever you see the first monster attack you. If you think you reacted late, then you can take a couple steps north just to make sure that the mage doesn't see you the same tick that the ranger does. So if you know anything about Inferno speedrunning, you've probably heard about how Wave 15 is super difficult and people die to it left and right. Now there's no shame in it, even good runners tend to die every now and then, but for the most part, these deaths only occur because people start the wave on low HP, then they make a risky play, and it's so early in the run that nobody wants to sip any of their brews. Next thing you know, you're back at the bank, or even worse, you're bacterial skipping. So really, the secret to surviving wave 15 is to just play it simple and play it safe. The 5 second time save that you're going to get from flicking, chinning the melee, and all these blobs together is not going to be what stops you from getting sub 55. So just simplify it, play it safe. This means blood barrage the nibblers if you're under 60 HP. Safe spot the melee on a blob or a pillar using section 1.6, and then full kill the melee. Then, all you have to do is deal with two blobs normally. Right now, the most you should ever do is get the health of the melee under half, and then pop the first blob so that you can kill the melee while the blob is popping. Anything more than that is unnecessary risk to get sub-55. Now, as you get faster and more experienced, you can experiment with more risky plays and situations, but this method is recommended so you don't die as often in the early waves, and thus you can get more practice at the waves that really matter. Trust me, dying on wave 15 makes you want to rip your hair out, and it's just not worth it when you're learning, so just play it safe and live at least the ranger. The setup now assumes you're comfortable with using chins and the tactics discussed in the sub-55 section. Similar to the sub-55 setup, you can choose to use Crystal or Armadil here, it's really kind of up to your preference. You're now at a stage where you can opt to take a Scythe, however, because this time is still very easy to achieve without one, Scythe tech and its basics will be discussed in the sub-50 section instead. For now, just know that if you do decide to take a Scythe, it's recommended to switch to Crystal and take at least a Super Combat, and even if possible, Ferocious Gloves or Blood Fury. To make space for these switches, you can choose to get rid of the Occult, a Sand View, a Brew, or a Range Pot. In the Sub-55 section, you learn the basics of Chins and gain the simplified plan which gives you some tools to go fast in the Inferno. Now we're going to optimize them. Your goal as you approach a low 50 and even sub 50 inferno time isn't just to make it through alive, but now to actually start playing fast. 
To do this, it's very important to be aggressive with your plays. Melees should not be scary. Be prepared to get up close and personal with them and off-tick everything manually. If you don't want to lose ticks, most waves will have you prayer flicking at least two monsters simultaneously, so get very used to running headfirst into monsters. Losing ticks is now a big deal and it's going to be very apparent in your splits. The difference between a 55 and a 50 is a 17 mage split or a 15 minute mage split. It's the difference between a 52 minute suck entry or a 47 minute suck entry. All these little 2 tick, 3 tick time losses are going to add up and now is where we start to fix them. One of the most powerful tools for speedrunning is the 2 tick block flick. Here we're going to explore more applications and setups to expand its flexibility. Something you might have noticed is at the start of a wave where a blob and a ranger see you instantly, the first blob attack is always one tick before the second range attack, and the second blob attack is always the tick after the next range attack. This is the root of the Adam Elikal flick, which only has you change prayers on the tick before and after the dominant monster's attack. When a blob is set on the regular two tick cycle, Every attack will rotate between one tick before the ranger or one tick after the ranger. And knowing this means you can essentially just change your prayer by looking at the range or the mage that's attacking you, rather than having to two tick flick the whole time. One of the benefits to this is that you have more freedom for action during the wave start, because all you have to do is flick the first blob one tick before the dominant monster. Once you change back, you don't have to look at your prayer book for another five ticks. Not having to worry about changing your prayer makes it easier to do whatever it is you need to do at the start of the wave without losing time. In addition, you can also conserve more prayer using this method by one tick flicking your quick prayers, or you can tank bats more efficiently since you can pray range for 10 out of 12 ticks during the range blob cycle. In the previous sections, you've learned not to kill melees or blobs last in order to avoid significant time loss, but now we're going to add rangers to that list. Ideally, you want to have a bat, nibbler, or mage in range mini blob as the last monster alive for every wave physically possible. This will result in a 2 tick time save for each wave, but it's also a lot more effort. This can take the form of trapping bats behind rangers, prayer flicking a mini blob to kill it after the ranger, or leaving nibblers alive to kill it after a ranger as well. Now keep in mind, it is still worth to chin the nibbler clumps at the start of a wave rather than to miss the chin and then kill the nibblers after the ranger. To consistently reach positions with minis, nibblers, or bats as the last monsters in the wave, you're going to have to start planning a couple steps ahead during the wave. Now to do that, we're going to introduce the concept of conditioning. Conditioning is controlling the health and location of monsters a couple steps in advance to put yourself in a better position later. Oftentimes this is going to mean intentionally leaving monsters alive, but with lower health in order to set up a chin, or maybe a body block, or maybe just a sandbag to hit during the blob's death animation. You can also condition pillars by leaving nibblers alive on it to lower its health if you want them to collapse on a later wave. So an example of conditioning is to reduce the health of a ranger before popping the blob so that you can kill the ranger before wiping out the minis, whereas if you didn't condition the health of the ranger, it would just be the last monster alive in the wave and you would lose two ticks for it. You can keep melees alive on low HP to body block bats, that way you don't get drained or take damage, and you can keep a close eye on pillars to balance your tick loss versus the pillar health. These are all examples of conditioning that you should keep in mind as you get faster in the Inferno. In addition, we're also going to demonstrate the concept of killing a blob specifically before a melee in order to lure the melee onto the blobs and then chin them all together. This has the added effect of bypassing the melee's defense since chins roll their accuracy on the main target's defense. So this technique can be very strong, but also very risky as flicking a blob and flicking a melee can result in unavoidable damage if you don't do melee step under off ticks. More often than not, you can reduce the risk of this setup by conditioning the blob to not pop too early and to make sure that the melee stays safe spotted until absolutely necessary. It's recommended to only bother with this setup if positions are easy to set up or you're at a relatively safe HP. The melee blob setup is particularly easy when the melee approaches the blob from either the north or the east. Otherwise, it's often not worth the time to set up. 
Here are examples to show how to do each setup when the melee comes from a different direction. The south setup just has you pull the melee along the east side of the blob until it's far enough north that you can treat it the same as a north or an east side setup. If you decide to corner trap the melee, make sure that you step in after popping the blob to stop the melee from stepping out of the clump. The west side setup just has you pull the melee directly north of the blob. From there, you can decide to path south of the blob so you won't have to tank the melee, or you can sit directly east of the blob so when you pop it you won't have to chin the ranger. Standing directly south of the blob will cause the melee to get caught on the melee mini, which can be very good for complex solutions where you want to avoid flicking the melee, the blob, or a range in a mage. Alternatively, if the melee is about to dig, you can stand on the west tile of the south side, and the melee will walk through all of the minis. Doing this, the melee will same tick with the minis, so it's only ever recommended if the melee is about to dig and you want to prevent that. One of the most difficult issues with speedrunning is closing distances between monsters without losing ticks. Dragging monsters works well when there's high HP spawns and they're next to pillars, but in cases where there's no pillars in sight or the spawns die too quickly to drag anything, NPCs which naturally walk towards the player should always be left alive to help bridge the gaps between long range monsters. This is especially the case with blobs as they have too little health to drag monsters in, they have an extremely long attack range, and they need to be killed pretty early in the wave, making them a nightmare to kill without losing ticks. On waves with isolated blobs and incoming bats or melees, it can be a good habit to target the blob early on so that the bats and the melees will naturally close the distance and give you something to attack when the blob pops. That way you can also kite them back to other monsters as well. Similarly, if nibblers are moving in the direction of a lone blob, it often works to follow the nibblers without killing them. That way you can pop the blob and then deal with the nibblers during the pop. On later waves, don't be afraid to flinch mages behind the pillar with your Tebow to pull them in closer. Flinching a mage can reduce the odds of a mage reviving an NPC, but it can also just pull the mage into distance to block revived foes from hitting you. Since a lot of the revived NPCs tend to spawn further south of the north pillar, they will usually get caught behind the mage if you're out of attack range. Pulling the mage in also sets it up to be blowpiped as it's the optimal weapon to use when the mage falls under 30 HP. Occasionally you'll find a mage or jad is left on 10 health, and you'll think it's a waste to send a full Tebow just to do 10 damage. Usually you're right. Most players tend to start blowpiping mages at around 30 HP, but this can sometimes be difficult due to long range positioning. In cases where the mage is under 18 HP, it's actually better to throw a chin instead of Tebow in as well, but maintaining proper positioning to blowpipe is always the optimal solution. The same can be said for jads, as below 12 HP chins and buckler can be thrown at healers if they're clumped with jad, and that will be better than tebowing. But if you have a scythe, you can also swap this threshold for just scything jad as well. Now that you're more accustomed to using chins, here's a list of the most common chin setups you'll be able to hit. Master these on top of the ones provided in section 2.3 and 3.4. So first off, you can lure melee mini blobs onto other monsters to chin as long as they're not the last monster in the wave. If a bat or melee spawns in the closer southwest spawn, then do one blowpipe on a nearby NPC and then chin the nibblers in the back. If a bat spawns in the farthest southwest spawn, then do two blowpipes after your initial chin and then chin the back nibblers. If a bat or melee spawns far south, then do two blowpipes after your initial chin, and then align yourself with the nibblers, then chin the nibblers in the back. Keep in mind, if it's the bat that spawns directly south, you'll have to wait before going west, or else the bat's gonna get caught behind the pillar. If the bat does get caught behind the pillar, it's not a big deal as you can just untrap the bat on the west side of the pillar and then chin it two to three blowpipes later as long as you step towards the east. If a melee or a bat spawns directly west, then you can instantly chin the back nibblers, similar to the northwest spawn. You won't always be able to hit this if the nibblers spawn too far to that side, but if it's a bat, then you can actually step into range to make sure that the bat doesn't walk out of the chin. If you're north of the west pillar, you can lure a melee or a bat over the nibblers and then chin them together when the southwest tiles align. 
If a range or a mage spawns directly west, then you can step behind the west pillar to pull it one tile north, and then you can chin the nibblers on top of it. If a blob is directly south of a ranger, pop the blob from the north side and then chin the melee mini when it spawns. The same principle applies if the blob is directly west of the ranger. If the same setup is directly south of the pillar, then pop the blob and then blowpipe the ranger so it will walk through the mage, then chin the range mini to clump them all together. If a blob is directly south of an NPC caught on the pillar, then pop the blob and immediately step at least two tiles to the back. This will pull the minis in, allowing you to chin them all together. If the same layout is on the east side of a pillar, kill the blob from the south side and then chin the range mini blob. Here, the ranger will naturally path into the clump. With a northeast bat and north nibs, you should move east for two blowpipes and then pull the bat north while chinning the nibblers. When aiming for a low 50 inferno speedrun, you should make the jump to some form of a healer skip, and in the process of that comes the concept of flicking sets. To start, it's best to enter Zuck with between 60 and 80 health to let your blowpipe specs heal you. Your brews and range pots are crucial during healer skips, so before Zuck you want to maximize your health without having to touch your brews. Flicking the sets themselves is actually pretty easy with a blowpipe. All you need to do is tag the second monster immediately after the first one without losing ticks. As long as you don't spec on the first two attacks, the set will automatically be set two ticks apart, since the regular blowpipe attack always has the same travel time. If you get an East Shield, you can usually kill the Ranger with your blowpipe before you have to worry about tagging the Mage. But if you want to be cautious, tag the Mage on an even number of attacks. So that would be your 2nd, 4th, 6th blowpipe, etc. With that, if you still need to heal, then you can brew up and then redefine range pot, but after that you'll be ready for the Jad Healer skip. The Jad Healer skip's also pretty simple, and some people consider it even easier than a regular Jad skip since you don't have to be as precise when clicking healers. The downside is that you do need to enter Zuck with at least a full regular range pot, or else your chance of survival drops dramatically. If committing to any healer skip, make it a priority to repot only with divines during the waves so that you have as much range pot for Zuck as possible. The basic Jad healer skip has you tag Jad with a chin and then tag the healers with blowpipes or chins depending on the situation. From there, you just continue killing Zuck like normal. When performing a healer skip, players should immediately sip a brew after bowing Zuck, and then they should re-sip the range pot before bowing again. This makes it so all bow hits are done on max range and you still get to heal. The effective DPS from being brewed down even a single time drops dramatically, so staying potted for all attacks is extremely important when it comes to surviving the healer skip. You can also mitigate some of the damage taken as healers will always shoot at least one fireball where you're standing. So moving two squares away, specifically after you see the healer's attack, will reduce the odds of taking damage. In addition, it's good to know that the tiles closest to the wall will drag you inwards when bowing Zuck, and bowing Zuck from this square will actually drag you out of the shield. So this means if you want to have the option to dodge vertically, you should attack from these columns to avoid getting dragged out accidentally. You'll find most players tend to be on these lines to make use of the T-bow drag on the far side, as well as the column closest to Zuck, which isn't a dead zone and is good for attacking while leaving the corner. Keep in mind, even though it's not in the dead zone, it's still not protected by the shield when you're in the corner, so only use it for entering or exiting corners, not when the shield is just camping there. Continue this until Zuck dies, or you run out of supplies, and that's the Jad Healer skip. A few instances of drag you'll start to notice as you get faster are nibblers during the early waves. When killing nibblers with gaps between them, aim to kill the ones in the back before the ones in the front, as the ones in the front are less likely to drag and thus will result in saved time. This also means on really early waves, you should aim to finish the nibblers before the bats, since the bat is less likely to drag than the nibblers. When exiting the north or south pillar, you should make a habit of coming from the east or the north side, because you're less likely to lose a tick doing so. As you can see in these examples, to instantly hit a monster coming out of the west or south side, 
you have to pre-move in that direction, which makes it easier to lose ticks if you're not prepared. Unless you specifically need to come out on this side, it's usually easier to go to the other side and then exit there instead. When blobs are popped out of position as the last monster during the wave, aim to blowpipe the melee blob and then immediately chin the mage and range clump afterwards. Because of the additional tick delay on chins, as well as the extended death animation of the melee blob, blowpiping the melee blob and chinning the mage in range is only one tick slower than chinning all three clumped, assuming you one hit them all. Compare this to chinning the mage in range and then blowpiping the melee, you're now going to be three ticks slower than if you had all three minis clumped from the start. In situations with a blob and a melee mini, you should just ignore the melee mini. This is because you can clump it with the other blob pop, and it'll die to the chins that you would have thrown anyway. So in cases like this, hit anything else that's not the melee mini. The same situation applies if the blob will clump with the nibbler. Attacking clumped monsters that are most likely going to die to your chin anyway is almost the same thing as just doing nothing. So if you took a scythe and there's nothing else in the wave to hit, scything the blob is a suitable option as well. This melee blob chin setup from the east side can be useful when you find yourself locked north of the west pillar or when circling west of the south pillar. If you're just shy of blowpipe range from a monster during a blob pop, Try for a blowpipe chin instead of just throwing a chin. Double blowpipe will always be better during a blob pop, but blowpipe chin is a great compromise that maintains high DPS and still gives you a lot of mobility. As you proceed into sub 50 territory, scythe tech is now suggested. Although you can still easily get the time just by playing better using the sub 52 setup, the setup we'll be going over here is going to assume you're using a scythe. For the suggested setup, armadil is no longer an option due to the negative slash bonuses and lack of prayer bonus. The extra prayer is needed as conventional scythe tech requires that you take a minimum of at least a super combat, as well as the scythe, but most players are also going to take an additional switch of either ferocious gloves for better damage, or blood fury for heals. Pick your switch based on your playstyle, but keep in mind that the blood fury switch technically has 8 negative slash bonus due to the Zarai Van Braces being equipped. If for some reason you're not interested in Scythe tech, you're still going to be perfectly capable of achieving the time, but you should aim to swap one of the switches in this setup for an additional range pot to increase the consistency of your healer skip. As you aim for sub 50, it becomes less about how many things you know and more about how good you are at them. You've learned the core principles of how to save time in sub 52. Getting sub-50 is literally just doing those strategies, but with less mistakes in execution. The strategies that you learned in sub-52 are going to be very prevalent from here on, and as such, this section is going to provide you with additional methods to speed up your time, but how well you manage your core strategies like conditioning and efficient pathing are going to be the main factors in how fast you get. Reminder that to play fast, you need to be aggressive. If you leave any off ticks to chance, the game is going to fuck you. Do your best to run at monsters, not away from them, and always be planning your next move. So you learned in the sub 55 section that as long as you started on the right tile, all the monsters in the wave would be on a two tick cycle. But in scenarios where they lose their line of sight, or when you're standing behind the pillar in the late waves, clearing the waves is significantly easier if you can manually reset them back onto the two tick cycle instead of being forced to one tick every wave. That's why the first step towards mastering the two tick flick is getting into the habit of manually setting blobs on a two tick cycle even during the late waves. This often means pulling monsters into range before intentionally stepping out into the open so that several monsters will see you all on the same tick or it can involve intentionally waiting before stepping out so that monsters will see you two ticks apart. The key is to stay calm and properly assess the situation, as well as the monster's line of sight. The most successful runners can set monsters on the two tick cycle at a moment's notice. Setting two tick is almost always worthwhile, even at the expense of losing a tick to set up. The extra mobility in the late waves allows you to easily move around, condition, and set up spawns which will in turn save you more ticks than it costs to set up originally. A lot of the time, blobs might lose sight of you when they pass by the south pillar, and this will put them on the odd cycle. 
having the awareness to notice this and manually reset them back on cycle can save precious health, especially in thrall runs. Another useful application of mastering the two-tick flick is the ability to keep a melee from digging while two-tick flicking a blob and a dominant NPC. In cases like this, the safest way to keep the melee from digging is to tank a melee hit on the cycle where the blob attacks one tick after the dominant NPC. In this example, the blob hits one tick after the mage, and that means that it's actually going to read my prayer on the next mage attack. This means that until the next mage attack, I'm free to pray whatever I want, giving me two ticks of leeway to go in, flick the melee, and reset its dig timer. This is a skill useful for keeping melees in a favorable position without having to break two tick cycle or tank any hits, thus potentially saving you a lot of trouble in the mid waves. You're now at a level that should strive to hit chins regardless of how difficult they are. So here are some more difficult or unconventional setups that you can opt to go for if you happen to see them. With north nibs and a bat caught on the pillar, simply step one west of the bat save spot and chin them together. You can corner trap the bat on the pillar if you don't want to kill it afterwards. If you get a bat behind or east of the blob, you can pull the bat east side of the blob and then pop it to chin them all together. This setup is particularly easy with the southwest blob and a south bat, but if you have two bats then go five north of the blob to chin both bats in the clump. Ranges or mages that spawn directly west during late waves can be dragged for one tick by moving in the opposite end of the pillar and then moving back instantly. This will pull their southwest tile onto the nibblers to let you chin them. If a melee is about to dig and your ranger has a lot of health left, you can stand one tile east of the ranger's northeast tile, and when the melee digs, you can move to the tile one north of the ranger's northwest tile. Then, chin the ranger to clump the melees. In most cases, this should only be implemented past wave 57. Blob behind ranger, but it's a little bit to the west and there's a bat behind it. Pop the blob and chin the mage mini to hit everything. Usually this setup will only occur around the east side of a pillar, so if you notice this spawn and you have a choice, choose to go around the east side because the bat won't walk through the minis on the west side. Scythe tech is essentially taking the Scythe of Vitter as a last hit weapon for the final monsters during the wave. The thought process behind it is that by scything the final monster instead of blowpiping, you'll save a tick on the last monster because there's no projectile delay with the scythe. You'll also save another tick because the scythe will trigger multiple hit splats on large monsters, and that can cause overkill which speeds up the death animations by another tick. Now through the work of many runners we've pushed this concept even further by taking extra switches to augment the strength and the consistency of the scythe. Thus, we can begin scything for damage rather than just scything so you get overkill. This is a key concept in properly using the scythe. Scythe is most effective against the rangers, but because of their 5 tick death animation, killing a mini blob and then scything a ranger on 5 health is about the same as just blowpiping the ranger and then blowpiping the mini blob afterwards. Both scenarios take 6 ticks to end the wave, so if all you took was a one-way scythe with no super combat and no switches, it's basically the same as if you didn't have the scythe at all, but you were just smarter with your kill order. By taking a super combat and an additional switch like Ferocious Gloves, the scythe becomes consistent enough that you can reliably scythe the ranger a full blowpipe ahead of what you would've had you not taken the switches or the super combat. This is why it's so heavily recommended to take the super combat and take those switches. When it comes to when you use your super combat, most players will usually pre-pot a divine on entry, and then they'll sip their first dose either at the double melee or at the first ranger. Sip your second dose when you fall to 112 strength, since that tick down causes you to lose multiple max hits. From there, the third and fourth doses are usually saved for waves 50 plus, as the super combat is significantly more effective on rangers than it is for melees and mages. Similar to the second dose, the fourth dose is usually used whenever you fall to 112 strength. The one precaution about the scythe is that by scything a monster that tick before it attacks, you give yourself the opportunity of getting meleeed by the NPC if you don't instantly kill it. On rangers, the melee max hit is 19, and it's big enough to chip away at your health if you don't have a blood fury, 
but the mages can hit 50s with their melees, and blobs can also punch 29s, so keep that in mind when you decide to go in for a scythe. Kill order with scythe varies slightly compared to without, as it's optimal to maintain 2x2 two two or larger monsters as your final NPC during the wave. The major difference now is that you should always opt to kill the nibblers and mini blobs before the rangers, whereas before you might have kept them alive so you could blowpipe after the rangers. Rather than conditioning rangers to die before the mini blobs, you should rearrange your priorities to leave rangers and bats with enough health to make sure that you don't kill the ranger too early or scythe too late on it. Bats should still be conditioned to kill after the rangers and after the melees, but assuming they're the last monster immediately after a ranger melee, you should always blowpipe before scything the bat. This is because immediately scything a bat after killing a ranger produces little to no benefit, but has way higher risk of not instantly killing the bat. As an example, if I kill a ranger with a blowpipe and then instantly scythe the bat, the ranger's gonna die on tick 6, but the bat's gonna die on tick 4 with overkill. The wave still ends on tick 6 anyway, because there's a ranger alive, so I just wasted an attack. Because a blowpipe scythe is incredibly likely to insta-kill bats from their full health, it's optimal to save a bat with full health as the last monster in a wave, rather than one you've already hit. According to Unpredictable's calculations, with 3-way scythe, bats under half health are better off killed with a blowpipe than conditioning to scythe after the ranger. Now with a 2-way scythe, you can just approximate it a little bit lower, so maybe use 10 health instead of 13. Scythe can also be used to kill blobs in niche situations. In cases where a blob is the last monster alive, or you don't have a good position to attack another monster during the pop, scything a blob for the final hit saves a little over a tick on average. Compared to blowpiping a monster twice, this is clearly not anywhere near as good. However, it can make the best of a bad situation, so keep this option in the back of your mind. Kill order can get even more complicated with combinations of a bat and a blob as the last monsters in the wave. Optimal kill order is going to be finishing off the minis and then scything the bat. However, you'll have to account for bringing the bat within melee range to not lose ticks running up to it. And you also need to make sure that you don't drag the melee blob when scything the bat, since the melee blob also has the longest death animation there. Situations with two bats as the last monster can get tricky as well. Currently, I recommend that you blowpipe the bat with the higher health, and then instantly scythe the one with the lower health after the first one dies. Since killing a bat from full health without a blowpipe in advance is not that consistent. Doing this, I guarantee at least a 2 tick time save due to the overkill and the projectile delay, but you also have to make sure to pull both bats close together, since it's very easy to drag bats during your scythe. You can also blowpipe the second bat once in advance as well, but if you one hit it, it'll cost you two ticks because you didn't scythe it, so it's really up to preference. The key thing to take home in this section is that you should do your best to condition either a high HP ranger or a high HP bat as the final monster for as many waves as you can. Section 3.6 discuss situations where mages are left on little to no health. In most cases, simply blowpiping them and then moving on with the wave is the optimal solution. However, as you get faster, you can also opt to kill them later in the wave, at the slight risk of having them revive a dead NPC. This technique is most often used between waves 38 and 48, and it's used to make use of the ticks during a blob or a melee's death animation. The main factors you need to consider when thinking about killing the mage last is how many monsters can it still revive, how much health does it have, and how far away is it. If the mage is likely to revive two bats before you can get to it, then it's probably better to just take the time loss on killing the melee last, rather than risk having two bats revive. Keep in mind that a mage melee situation can be treated similarly to a bat melee situation. Since both the bat and the mage are scythable and have the same death animation, you can kill a melee and then immediately blowpipe into scythe on a mage, and you'll still kill it without losing any ticks. If your goal is to pop a blob and then kill a conditioned mage during the pop, this is best done when the mage is within blowpipe distance, as the Tipo projectile delay can be massive, sometimes giving the mage an opportunity to revive the blob. This is especially the case if you miss more than once with the Tebow. 
If a mage is around 30 health and within blowpipe range of the blob, a suitable alternative can be to pop the blob and then blowpipe spec the mage for the increased accuracy rather than just T-bowing. Mage Jad Healer is the final skip recommended for speedrunning, and it looks a lot harder than it actually is. Similar to the Jad Healer skip from section 3.9, it's recommended to enter with at least a full brew and at least a full range pot, or else you're just probably going to die. On top of that, you probably only have one range pot due to the Scythe tech inventory, so make it an absolute restriction to only repot with divines during the waves. During Zuck, kill the ranger as normal, but tag the major with a blowpipe and if possible, drag it to the middle by touching the east wall before Jad spawns. This makes it so you don't accidentally off-tick the mage during healers. After Jad spawns, you should tag Jad using a chin exactly two ticks after the mage's attack. A common visual cue that people use is they tag Jad as the mage is turned upside down during its attack animation. Make note that if you're on the far west rotation of the room, you must tag Jad using long range chins or else you're going to get dragged out and potentially same tick Jad or tank a Zuck hit. Manually switch your chins back to rapid before the healer tag, as switching it back immediately after tagging Jad can pull you out of the shield. Doing these tags properly will cause Jad to attack two ticks apart from the mage, but on occasion it might be one tick apart. From there, tag the healers as optimally as possible, flick the monsters, and apply the fundamentals that you learned from section 3.9. To reiterate from section 3.9 as well, it's extremely important to brew Bastion between bow hits while performing your healer skip, as you already saw that doing your bow hits just single brewed down increases the time to kill Zuck by 36 seconds. Bowing unpotted will quite literally run you out of supplies and get you killed. A good mentality to have is to treat bowing unpotted as if it's guaranteed to miss. Although it's not technically true, missing 20% of your active DPS is significant to the point that you shouldn't be okay with knowingly hitting unpotted. The average suck using this skip is estimated to be slightly over 3 minutes using full crystal, vambraces, etc., assuming you're fully potted and not missing ticks, but you can expect some variance due to your healer proc and potential misplays, as well as running out of range potion. I've mentioned this several times already, but I think it's important enough that we put extra emphasis on it. A large aspect of playing fast is planning ahead. You should always be thinking of how to make your next task in the wave easier. Oftentimes this takes the form of preemptively off-ticking monsters, so you're not forced into a rushed off-tick where you take damage and lose time. Sometimes this means you have to manually drag a blob closer to a mage instead of just standing in the middle flicking both of them. During mage waves, it helps to position yourself in an area where revived NPCs are going to be body blocked by other monsters, since the resurrected monsters tend to spawn south of the north pillar. Be aggressive. As you aim for a sub 50 time, you should feel comfortable in the inferno now, so you have to manually off tick monsters and you have to play to maximize your ticks, because many of the best solves are dependent on you not hesitating. The second you start hesitating, panicking, and running away, the worse things will go, the more ticks you'll lose, and all it takes is a few bad waves to ruin good pace. In pursuit of a sub-4730 completion, Scythe Tech is now almost a given. Most current setups tend to fall into the categories of either Mega Scythe or Thralls. Setups begin to vary in their brews and sand views depending on your playstyle, but generally speaking, this is the threshold where players should get comfortable with a maximum of three brews to make space for more switches. Mega Scythe setups tend to have at least three melee switches, as well as a super combat. Thrall setups tend to have less melee switches, but require a Book of the Dead, Mage Cape for swapping to Ancients on wave 50, and they're very hard on your prayer. Between the two of them, Thrall is expected to have higher potential, but Mega Scythe is significantly easier to survive, and it's not reliant on having daily cape swaps. Either one is very suitable for sub-48 or sub-4730. Mega Scythe tech generally refers to having Pharaohs, Blood Fury, Scythe, and a Super Combat in one setup, 
but you can also throw in additional switches if you think you can play with them effectively, such as an Infernal Cape and Prim Cam. At its core, Mega Scythe is recommended for its increased consistency in scything rangers early. You can see that as your super combat ticks down, the max hits on your scythe depreciate more steeply with your two-way setups than the three-way setup. Three-way scythe essentially has more consistent kills than the two-way ferocious, but it also has the healing and the late wave defense from the two-way blood fury. Assuming the range or the melee are the last monsters in the wave, the optimal HP to scythe is 46 for the ranger and 36 for the melee. However, it's worth noting that scything a little bit early is significantly better than scything late. If you look at the data, scything slightly ahead of optimal HP loses about a tick at most. However, as you start to switch at lower and lower HPs, the tick saved starts to drastically decrease. And this effect only starts to get more and more pronounced as your pot starts to tick down. If there's anything to take home about scythe tech, it's that you should scythe earlier rather than later. Lastly, I'm going to include some data on some experimental switches. These are largely untested and unrefined, but there's some ideas that we've been throwing around. 4-way scythe with the infernal cape doesn't increase the scythe's potential by that much, but it's nice for having better tick downs, since the 4-way on 110 strength has the same max hit as the 3-way scythe on 118. You can repot at 110 up until wave 50 and then sip the rest of the super combat as you normally would and you'd be potted for the entire run. On top of that, people have speculated camping primordials with it, as scythe becomes better DPS than the blowpipe for melees and ranges, in exchange for a small time loss on mages, jad, and zuck. When using this setup, take between 1 or 2 divine super combats to maintain 49 max hit. The extra damage doesn't really matter because you'll be scything things so often that the blood fury is going to heal it all back. Or if you'd rather sacrifice your hands instead of the 13 range accuracy, you can take a Torva plate body instead of the prims and you'll achieve a similar result. The main problem with these setups is that you now have to worry about overkill damage with your scythe instead of just the Tebow. So it can be difficult finding when to blowpipe and when to hail mary the scythe, but that's why this setup is still largely experimental. Standard Thrall tech involves starting the waves on the Archaeus spellbook with blood, soul, and cosmic runes in the rune pouch. A Book of the Dead and a Trident of the Swamp are taken to smuggle death and fire runes into the run so you can cast thralls and death charge, and you'll need a max cape or a magic cape so you can spellbook swap on waves 50 and 66 to go back to Ancients for blood barrage, or to return to thralls for jad and zuck. Using this setup, your methods of healing are largely restricted to just death charging blowpipe specs, blood fury scythe swings, brewing, and the occasional redemption. Mish setups without the magic cape can stay on thralls for the entirety of the run, however, currently not many people use this pure thrall setup due to its high flicking requirement and volatile late waves. If you do decide to take this setup, it's recommended to take at least an additional brew to make up for the lack of blood barrage. Due to the high prayer required to constantly summon thralls, as well as the lack of inventory spaces, a fully charged Falador Shield 4 is recommended to maximize prayer per inventory slot, and setups have been used where players swap two staminas for a fully charged Explorer's Ring 4, as well as a max cape with the stamina perk in order to save an inventory slot. Upon entering a thrall run, you should instantly drop 5 Sandfews and empty your trident. If you want to min-max your DPS, summon a Thrall, finish the Nibblers, and then blowpipe spec the first bat before death charging to make sure you don't overflow on special attack energy. From then on, continue death charging every minute and summoning Thralls during the waves. You should have enough special attack to spec the first blob as well, but many players will opt to save their blowpipe specs until they've either lost enough health to heal from it, or until the melee has spawned since it's usually pretty tanky. Since you won't have Blood Barrage, Thralls are generally played on the safer side, where you avoid putting yourself in these high-risk, high-reward situations unless you're close to full health. You might find it beneficial to reduce tanking bats and mini blobs compared to your regular runs, even at the cost of losing chin opportunities. Thrall setups tend to be strong enough that even when you're playing on the safer side, you can still break your former PB splits. With Thralls, any damage you take is much more meaningful since you can't recover the health very easily. Do your best to avoid tanking unnecessary hits. 
If you manage to make it to wave 50, you can cape swap back to Ancients so you get Blood Barrage Nibblers at the start of the wave. For the next 15 waves, it's just a regular Ancients run, except you have to pay a little bit more attention to your pillar health. Due to the lack of a Kodai or an Occult, as well as Ice Barrage, you might find that your pillars are going to take excess damage. Now by this stage, you should be competent enough that you can focus the nibblers without wasting too much time, but if your pillar does go down, most players will start no pillar waves in the northwest quadrant of the map. At the end of wave 65, you can feel free to swap back to thralls so you can death charge and thrall for triple jads and suck. I'd only recommend doing this if you're pacing, but Thralls can help a lot on triples and even though they're not able to hit Zuck itself, the Death Charge gives you precious blowpipe specs that you might need for extra health or a little bit of damage, so it's good to do just in case. In the current max gear setup, your max hit on a mage is 86 at 112 range. However, at 111 range your max hit is 83. As you might guess, this is a bit of a problem when it comes to the waves after 35, as bats are frequent and a single drain can roughly reduce your damage output by 4%. As such, when aiming for exceedingly fast times, it helps a lot to reduce the bat hits as much as physically possible. This can be done through body blocking, but in cases where it isn't an option, instantly nuking a bat with a blowpipe spec or backstepping when the bat lines up with an additional monster's attack cycle can be very useful. If you've already been drained, try to redivine when killing mages as sub-50 runners often have additional doses to spare. If you happen to be low on divines, aim to repot after a double bat wave so the likelihood of getting drained instantly is reduced. Although thralls are unanimously considered faster, you should also take into account the conversion rate when using both setups. It's generally accepted that if you can't make it to Zuck close to full health with a full brew and a full range pot, you're probably just going to die on the healer skip. So if you can only manage to make it there with these supplies, maybe 1 in 10 times on Thralls, compared to 1 in 4 on Ancients, you might have better odds achieving your goals running the Mega Scythe setup despite it being slower on average. At the time of writing this guide, less than 15 players had a sub 4730 completion. Now with the new gear being released from Raids 3, it's expected that these time thresholds are only going to get faster. However, the main strategies and principles used in speedrunning are going to continue to be useful even after the gear has evolved. At the end of the day, if you want to get faster, focus on improving small optimizations and do some VOD reviews. So that's all I've got for you guys for now. I might have forgotten some stuff since there was so much to cover, but if so, I'll try to include it in the comment section below, along with a list of references to all the original clips used in this video. I hope the guide was useful, maybe it can help people appreciate and get better at Inferno speedrunning. And I hate plugging, but I sunk a lot of hours and stress into making this guide, so... I don't know, if you like the content, or maybe you found it useful, it helps me a lot if you guys drop a sub, or even if you just go follow my Twitch. But yeah, I mean, that's about it. Hopefully you guys can get cracked at Inferno Speedrunning. Definitely go join the Inferno Speedrunning Discord if you want a welcoming and pretty much all-inclusive Inferno-based community. And everybody who helped contribute to this guide is there as well, so hopefully we'll see you there.